Hi, I'm Jason Jasperson. Welcome to my studio. On this episode of The Process, I'll walk you through the unique challenges of making a large woodblock print. What we're doing here is called relief printmaking. And what I mean by that is the inked surface is the high surface. So in preparing my blocks, I've cut away areas that are meant to be blank. So if we look at this block, you can see the letters that are reversed uh, are cut away. And on the final print, those areas have no ink. They're white. The paper shows through. And so uh, this relief process relies on um, ink hitting the high spots of the printing matrix or the printing plate. So in the relief printing process, um, the, the plate or the wood is carved. All the places that I don't want to print are cut away. And then the block is inked with a roller so that those low places get missed by the roller. The roller skims over the top and just leaves ink across the top of the plate. Then we put the plate in the press with paper facing it and we run it through a lot of times with some sort of a cushion uh, just to kind of even out the pressure. We run it through the press and the press uh, pushes hard at that point of contact with the roller and then um, and then the ink has transferred from the block to the paper. When you take the paper off uh, you should have, if everything went right, you should have a nice uh, reverse image of the block. So to produce this relief print, I realized that this is the largest relief print I've ever had to make, and that posed some specific challenges, um, carving blocks this large, inking blocks this large, and printing them required me to think differently, build a printing press, build a large ink roller, and uh, make a lot of prints. One of the reasons I really love relief printing is because you don't need really special tools. This can be done on a smaller scale. You can use scrap lumber, um, maybe an X-Acto knife or a box cutter to cut the block, uh, some regular paper and a little bit of paint or ink, and you can uh, use a wooden kitchen spoon and, and print. It's really a process that anybody can do. And it's also a process that can be developed into a, a very complex, um, high-level piece. So I love that spread, that it's, it's really kind of a democratic art. Anybody can do this. The first woodblock print I ever made was uh, with an X-Acto knife on a 2x4 and a little bit of ink and printer paper. And I used a wooden spoon to print it. And what I love about this, this process, uh, this medium, is that that can happen. I'm using a printing press and, and rubber ink rollers and, and that sort of thing, but you don't have to. It's really, if you break it down, it's really like a stamp. And it can be made out of simple materials. I've, you know, people use potatoes to make stamps. Um, they don't last very long. But um, if somebody wanted to get into this, they certainly could. I think it's something that anybody can start and develop um, and the more you work at it, the better you get. This project um, was a commission, is a commission for a memorial for somebody who um, served as a principal in a Lutheran grade school in, in Wisconsin. And uh, the family wanted to have um, something that represented this Bible passage, Jeremiah 29:11 in which God says, uh, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. 
and uh, this was a favorite of this principal and so um, you know it's it's encouraging advice for young people uh, that that there's a plan in place for their life so um, sometimes what I have to do is try to take something invisible like a concept like that and figure out how to make it visible if I'm gonna make uh, artwork out of it somehow there has to be there has to be something to look at and so I start doing the really hard work the hardest part of any project is uh, the concept For a long time I've thought about an acorn as, as a really good symbol of potential. That the acorn or any seed really holds holds the the whole future plant in its little capsule. And so when you look at this acorn, um, you're seeing this object, but you're also, if you're thinking about it properly, you're seeing potential. You're seeing what it could become. Uh, so the idea in this project is that uh, I'm showing you both at the same time. You see the acorn and then also, uh, maybe not on first glance, um, you see what it can become, this, this large, uh, noble tree. So that's my intent, and, and I think it's, it's pretty straightforward. People might not see the tree right away, and I'm okay with that. I kind of like it when, when an artwork presents itself and you think you know what you're looking at and then and then something happens in your mind a little switch happens kind of like when you see an optical illusion for the first time and you can never unsee that I like that moment where where suddenly a switch happens I guess there's something meta about this there you know I'm talking about I'm showing an acorn becoming a tree and I'm carving in wood the process can be part of the message or the medium can be part of the message and I've worked on um, trying to uh, trying to make some of the wood grain show. I don't know if the camera will pick this up, but I, I took a, a wire brush to this to really kind of show the show the wood grain so that it would wear away the soft parts and the higher parts will show and then the press and the paper pick up those high points. You get a sense of the actual wood. Um, rather than just a flat surface. So I did a, I did a digital mock-up uh, and had it printed out large and in reverse because uh, printmaking always results in a reverse. And so um, I used this to actually trace onto three different blocks of plywood um, and then from that tracing I used a router to uh, very carefully cut out letters and and take away some some large masses so I have a, a plunge router and I will you know sort of drop that in and very carefully cut away according to the drawing that I put down and uh, because this is a multicolor print I'm cutting several blocks so there's a different block for each color um, and so a lot of this, all of this was cut away with the router, really kind of like fast and, and sloppy work. But, but then in here, this is all chisel work done with um, various size gouges. Uh, and all these parallel lines were, were done with a ruler and um, kind of painstakingly done. So the router is a nice shortcut, but... Um, but you know the part that really matters, the part that really affects the print, is done with uh, hand tools, with gouges. This is the biggest print that I've ever attempted. It's 24 by 24 inches, which 
in terms of paintings, it's not that big. In terms of a woodblock print, it gets to be quite a bit of um, quite a bit of surface area to try to carve, ink, and distribute pressure. Before I had a printing press, uh, I would print with a wooden spoon. I just put paper on the block, on the inked block, and and rub every square centimeter of that surface with a wooden spoon. And the prospect of 24 by 24, whatever that comes out to in square inches, uh, with a wooden spoon was just it was just too much. I mean, I could just feel my arm falling off. So um, I knew that for this project I would need a press. Um, and uh, I tried I tried getting a hold of uh, some local local uh, printing press opportunities, for example, uh, schools, um, or there are some galleries or or people who own them. Um, it's pretty rare to have a press big enough for the project that I'm trying. And so this is this is a classic example of me uh, doing re the ready fire aim method of approaching something. Um, so I took this project on not really having a way to do it. The press was kind of a problem for a while, trying to figure out how to how to solve this. And um, so like I said, I've, I've contacted uh, several places that have presses. I looked into buying a printing press and seriously considered it. Um, contacted some companies that custom build presses. Um, and I purchased plans online for how to build your own. I watched a lot of YouTube videos. And then I sit and think, you know, I, I do all that stuff and it all kind of happens uh, spread out. I'll kind of give a, give one thing a thought and a try for a while and then let it sit. And I'll give something else a thought and a try for a while and let it sit. And I remember uh, I took a nap one day <laughs> and, uh, and I was thinking about this problem and, and I woke up with the realization that I make stuff. And I, I had recently purchased a welder and I started putting, putting things together in my head like parts that I could get from a hardware store. I started uh, thinking it through, and I guess af after that nap, I just realized, you know what, I, I guess I can just do it. I'll just jump in and, and give it a shot. Uh, and so, you know, my, my brain just switched at that point, that that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna build it. The process of, of putting this together was very sort of uh, fits and spurts. It happens in fits and spurts. So, you know, I'll, I'll think about one mechanism at a time and try to figure out, for example, the rollers, they're probably the, you know, the most picky part. They need to be consistent so that as the block runs through the rollers, there's even pressure. Um, so, you know, I would think about that for a while. How do I build rollers that are centered, that are the right length? What kind of things uh, are locally available that I could use? I thought about cutting uh, plywood circles and stacking them and sanding that. I thought about, uh, I actually talked to a machine shop to get uh, some, some bids on what it would take to, to get machined maybe aluminum or stainless steel rollers. Um, I thought about PVC and I ended up using black uh, black plumbing, steel pipe with um, with an axle going all the way through and using washers to kind of center that axle and I sort of shimmed those washers to try to make it as centered as I, I could make it. Um, you know, once the rollers are figured out, I have to figure out some other things like a crank mechanism and uh, an adjustable height. 
The adjustable height is taken care of by uh, bar clamps available at any hardware store, and they have a screw. But you know, I thought I thought real hard about how do I build this or what kind of what kind of things exist, and in the end, when you know when I have it done, it feels like the answers were obvious. But before I knew what the answers were, they were not obvious. I had to really like come to these obvious answers, come to a relatively elegant solution by not rushing by not rushing myself. So I wait and I think and then I think a little bit more before I act. Um, the kind of skills that are required or that I used to build this press included um, creative shopping, you know, looking at things in ways that they're not intended to be used, uh, welding, some minor woodworking, and an ability to tinker. There's a lot of tinkering. You know, I didn't get it right the first time. Uh, so, you know, I move things and I try things differently. And I, I think that's a really important understanding that it's okay if things don't turn out perfectly. You don't, you don't have a fit, you don't, you know, get sad or whatever. You just look at it and think about it and try it a different way. Don't ever think that you're going to get something right the first time. If you do, that's bonus. That's really nice. But I think it's very normal for things to not go right. from the prospect of spending about $10,000 on a press to spending maybe a couple hundred altogether and spending a lot of brain power. I can remember there's hardware store parts that I purchased. There's a, a part of a bike that I took apart. Um, there's a piece of a light fixture, some copper pipe, threaded rod, um, leftover plywood, and it's not a perfect press. I, I suspect that anybody who's a printmaker would be somewhat dissatisfied using this press. Uh, it's not as precise as a professional press. Um, the pressure is, is not as consistent as a professional press. But, but it's my press, and uh, it produces the kind of results that my press produces. So I'm okay with it not being a perfect, precise machine because well, because it's a trade that I'm willing to make. I'm willing to um, save the money, have the experience of building it, know my machine inside and out, and, uh, and have unique results every time it runs a print. I, I remember learning that uh, the, the band, the 60s, 70s rock band, The Kinks, uh, had a, an amplifier that was torn. And and that's the kind of thing that could be a heartbreaker, especially if you're a beginning band or a young band that can't afford the equipment. But for them, they, they flipped that around and turned it into a positive thing, and the sound of that ripped amplifier became their signature guitar sound. So I, I think that's a really powerful idea, that, that the things that go wrong can be the things that really went right. And so while my printing press might not be uh, the most precise machine, um, it produces results that no one else can really produce because it has imperfections that no other machine has. And so I'm really, I'm really kind of fascinated by the individual quality of things that don't go right. Uh, whether I'm painting or, or printmaking, I tend to use a limited palette, and that means that I generally use only the primary colors and maybe black and or white. Um, part of the reason I do that is because it, it uh, provides a unity among the, the colors. They all come from the same ingredients, and so they 
it's they look better together. I really don't believe in. Uh, I rarely use colors as they come from the factory. Um, so every color that I use is, is really my custom mix. Um, certain colors are stronger than other colors and um, for example the, it takes a lot of white to counteract anything dark. And so if I, if I need to lighten a batch of color uh, it's going to take a lot of my white. Or, or I'll separate out or I'll separate out some of that color and uh, and then you know sort of even the odds with the white. Uh, sometimes when I'm chasing a color it can really you know sort of turn into this big blob, this big mass that I need to store, I need to get bigger containers. I make a lot of prints to try to get a few prints because there are so many different uh, variables. Uh, the thickness of the ink, the color of the ink, the absorbent quality of the paper, the pressure of the rollers, uh, all of these all of these variables can make a print go right or wrong and uh, more often wrong and so I need I need to run so many test prints to try to get all of those variables just right in a way that I can reproduce so that I can make a couple good prints. Like I said, this print is a memorial for a, a principal, a Lutheran principal that passed away, and I hope that uh, as it hangs uh, kind of in his memory that it, it continues to give the encouragement that he gave, that God has a plan for your life, and while you may not know that, that's kind of looking at the acorn and not really knowing, not really seeing the potential yet. Things need to unfold. And so, especially in a young person's life, you know, you're kind of looking at an acorn and they don't, they don't, nobody really can see exactly uh, what that life is going to unfold to be. So I really hope that this is a, an image of hope, something that, uh, that encourages young people especially to just uh, trust, keep going, and, uh, and know that there's good things ahead.